and their thoughts were only for themselves. And what especially annoyed the French was when he started pulling strings in both the French and British armies at her instigation to have their chef demobilized so that he could return to their kitchen. How are we going to go on if we can't have that iced tomato juice on lettuce leaves? You know, what about our plain steaks and chicken? Who's going to mix our tea with that barrel of London water we have at the constant ready? Surely we can't expect it to do that on our own. Good morning, happy Sunday. Welcome to another episode of Trader King. We are still doing Trader King. So if there was any fear in your heart that I had suddenly switched over to Jada Pinkett Smith's book and left us all hanging, no, I wouldn't do that. I'm too invested in this story. This story is awesome. I mean, I would just be an idiot not to jump on the whole Jada Pinkett Smith thing because that's what everyone's talking about. And because I do review memoirs and biographies on this channel, that was an obvious one I had to do. So going to do that one some during the week, but we still have our Sunday treat here. And this episode is so, so cathartic for me because I've been really annoyed this entire book that he still had friends who were standing next to him, even when his friends could see everything that was happening. In this chapter, all holds are off. Everybody who is still giving him a pass on his behavior, everyone who's still like trying to stand by his side, people are no longer willing to still lay it all down for him. Why they were willing to in the first place, I cannot even imagine, except for some extreme loyalty on some of their parts. Because I don't see that they weren't getting anything financially out of it. They, weren't, they certainly weren't getting any sort of position or reputation out of it. So I've been wondering for a really long time why people like Fruity Metcalf are still by his side. I'm like, that is a deep and abiding friendship. If you would still be willing to stand next to David when he treats you poorly, when he's rude to everybody, it's a constant embarrassment being around him. But um, this chapter is just so, so, so refreshing because, you know, sometimes in the correspondence to other people, there's a lot of sort of talking around the issue or hinting at it. Or, um, you know, the British, unlike the Americans, will say things without saying things. There's lots of insinuations. There's lots of um, suggestions at what you mean, but not actually spelling it out for the sake of propriety. No more. People are writing to each other and just boldly saying how they really feel about David and Wallace. And it is just exactly what you're ready to hear, especially coming off of last chapter. Now, I'm not going to do a long intro, but I do want to remind you that in the last chapter, war is uh, coming. It's no longer a what it will, you know, it will it, could it, is it going to happen vibe anymore. And it's coming. So you better get your butt out of here and back to England if you want to safely survive this. And David and Wallace are just dragging their feet and their friends have made plans. Freddie Metcalf has gone beyond the beyonds to help him. And he is just kind of like, yeah, it's not the transportation I want. So he has rejected all of their plans time and time again. So this next chapter starts right at the end of the previous chapter, where Fruity Metcalf is just frustrated beyond anything that we've seen from him thus far. Now, he's been critical of David, certainly, and he's written his wife, Bob, on many letters that were very interesting to read, because between the two of them, they have very open communication. But even he has sort of tempered what he has to say with still remembering his loyalty to David, still saying, well, David was difficult tonight, but you know, Wallace is hard too. No more. So this is just exactly what we all have been waiting to hear. Um, all right, so let's begin there. Um, remember, as always, please like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. Now this chapter is called Phony War, and you'll remember from history that Phony War refers to the first eight months of World War II when nothing was really happening, but there was lots of threats that something was going to happen. There was one small engagement when France invaded an, a regional area of Germany, but other than that, there wasn't a whole lot going on. But this is where everybody is figuring out their places, like what are they going to do during the war? And this is where they're trying to figure out what is David going to do? You know, we've got to give him, the, the British government felt they had to give him some kind of a job, but certainly nothing important and nothing, nothing where he was going to find out anything that was important information because he was leaky as a sieve and they know that. Okay, so the chapter is officially called Phony War, but what I would entitle it is the betrayal of his very, very dear friend because that is what is really highlighted in this chapter. 
It's a great one. Get ready. Okay. Um, Fruity was furious to discover that the offer of the plane to Britain had been withdrawn after the Duke had insisted that he would only return if the couple were invited to stay at Windsor Castle. The Duke was given some wartime job and Wallace awarded the status the former king believed his wife was entitled to. So those are his uh, points of contention. If I don't get these things, I'm not going. <laughs> and Fruity is over it. A thousand times over it. And he writes to Baba. I just sat there still. I held my head and I listened for about 20 minutes and then I started. He said, he told them, you have just behaved as two spoiled children. You only think of yourselves. You don't realize that there is at this moment a war going on, that women and children are being bombed and killed while well, you talk of your pride. God, it makes me sick. You forget everything and only thinking of yourselves, your property, your money, and your stupid pride. You are just nuts. And if this plane is sent out to fetch you, which I doubt very much, then get into it and be buddy grateful. But every half hour, it's, I won't go by the plane. We'll motor to Paris. And I point out the impossibility of doing that. Roads blocked with troops, no hotels, etc., etc. And today, there's talk of them getting a destroyer sent out. So Fruity is just beyond frustrated with them. And just... At, 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 the, at, at the fact that they are so selfish that they think that they can just dilly-dally and say, well, we don't want to go that way. Well, we don't want to go this way. We just can't decide if we want to leave. We're not being given what we want on the other side. You better go while the getting is good. You know, no more of this dragging your feet and acting like you have a choice. You don't. And all your friends are doing everything they can to help you. Take the help and shut up. Well, they said that they wanted to go out on a destroyer. That seemed like a good plan. But then Mockton showed up. Mockton arrived by plane and he said, let's get in, let's go. But the rescue was rejected because Wallace had a fear of flying. But also there just wasn't significant room for their luggage. Friends, what is this? Okay, Wallace, you understand that if a plane is going to be sent to you, you're gonna to have to get in it. Like why was this net point never raised before? Like now that the plane has arrived, she's like, mm-hmm. But I don't like flying. Well, gather your gumption, gal, and let's get on. And apparently, the Duke had told somebody at the embassy that it was ridiculous that they should have to go in that tiny little plane because they could not be expected to arrive in England for a war with only a grip. <laughs> a small bag? Please. We need all our luggage. You know, so if you're going to come and get us, you better get us with proper accommodations. Thank you very much. All right, well, Mockton returned alone. And then the Duke told Churchill, who had been appointed First Lord of the Admiralty, that it would greatly facilitate the Duchess and my return to England if you could send a destroyer or some kind of other naval vessel to any French Channel or port Monday or Tuesday. That'd be great for our schedule. And this would really help us to bring our party of five with us and then also the small amount of luggage for the journey. And you know, by small amount of luggage, he probably meant like 50 bags. Two days later, on September 8th, the party set off in a convoy of three cars for the Channel Ports. They were met by Lord Louis Mountbatten, and they spent the time zigzagging across the Channel to avoid any enemy submarines. And they landed later that day at the same quay from which the Duke had left almost three years earlier. There was no member of the family to meet them, no message, no offer of a car or office. Instead, and only because Churchill intervened, they were met by a Royal Marine Band and the CNC Portsmouth Admiral Sir William James, who put them up for the night in the Admiralty House. Well, the whole thing is such an embarrassment. The next day, Baba uh, showed up and brought them to the Metcalf home in Ashdown Forest, which was to be their base in Britain, along with the Metcalf's London home. If it weren't for Fruity Metcalf, they would have literally nothing. I'll tell you that much right now. And then on September 14th, the Duke saw the King, which was their first meeting since the abdication. And not surprisingly, it did not go well. Chip Channon wrote later in his diary that the visit has been a flop, due, I fear, to the hardness of the old queen who was quite unforgiving. Yeah, she did not want the king to show any kind of kindness to the duke. She was really over the duke on a thousand and different levels. But George wrote himself in his own diary that he was disgusted by David because he seemed to think only of himself. And he had quite forgotten what he had done to his country in 1936. 
Two days later, he noted in his diary that commanding officers, quote, must not tell David or show him anything really secret. And this begins another theme of this ch chapter. So the two themes are David is the worst friend you've ever heard about. And you can't tell David anything because he will trot himself right over to the first listening ear. Doesn't matter who's listening ear. He just wants to have the tidbit, the gossip. He wants to be in the know and he wants you to know that he's in the know. Lord Crawford was even more critical of than the king had been in his own diary. And this is one of the most refreshing passages I've ever read. It's just so honest. It's no longer trying to tiptoe around the tulips. He wrote, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor are back in England. It's announced that he's about to take up a public appointment. But a stray field marshal is not easily placed, nor a superfluous admiral of the fleet. And he can't do the work allotted to his younger brothers Kent and Roly-Poly Gloucester. He's too irresponsible as a chatterbox to be trusted with confidential information, which will be passed on to Wally at the dinner table. That's where the danger lies. Namely, that after nearly three years of complete obscurity, the temptation to show that he knows that he is again at the center of information will prove irresistible and he will blab and babble out state secrets without realizing the danger. I dined with Howe at the club, he's working at the Admiralty, and to his consternation saw the door of the secret room open, the basement apartment where the position of our fleet and enemy is marked out by the hour. And lo, out came Churchill and the Duke of Windsor. Howe was horrified. Yeah, you don't say, can you imagine? What was Churchill thinking? What to do with the Duke was to prove a problem. He'd originally been offered a choice of posts. Yeah, so they said, all right, you, you can do one of two things. You can be the Deputy Civil Defense Commissioner for Wales, or you can liaison with the British military mission in France. So they told him he could pick his first. And of course he wanted to pick the one in Wales. But that was taken right out from underneath him because the next day he was told that the king had vetoed the appointment on the grounds that he did not want the former king in Britain. Here, here, dear king, good choice. Because you know, if David was had feet on the soil, he would begin to inch his way forward the best he could. Baba Metcalf was under no delusions that this was going to go well because the Duke now had to go ahead and do the job as the British liaison for the French. And she said, I see endless trouble ahead with the job in France as I don't think he will think it big enough. And I doubt he's getting on with Wombat. Wombat was the nickname for the Major General that he would be reporting to. His real name was Major General Sir Richard Howe Weiss. But Baba Metcalf went on to say in her diary, I do think the family might have done something. He might not even exist but for one short visit to the king. Wallace said they realized there was no place ever for him in this country and she saw no reason ever to return. I didn't deny it or do any pressing. They are incapable of truly trusting anybody. Therefore, one feels one's loyalty is misplaced. Their selfishness and self-concentration is terrifying. And what I'm finding it difficult to put into words is the reason for his only having so few friends. One is so perpetually disappointed. I love that. One is so perpetually disappointed. Yes, yes. Here, here. And that is very true. Because they won't trust you, it's like, why am I still loyal to you? You know, David and Wallace go through life never being completely and 100% transparent, never actually laying their trust in anyone. So it just feels like, why are we working so hard for you? Because you don't return the gesture. Well, the views of the royal family were clear. I haven't heard a word about Mrs. Simpson. I trust she'll soon return to France and stay there, wrote the queen to Queen Mary. I am sure that she hates this dear country and therefore she should not be here in wartime. After that troublesome visit where nobody wanted them and it was clear that everyone was just trying to shuffle them about, they, they decided to go back to France, uh, which of course they would have had to do eventually anyway because the Duke had to start his new job. What was meant to be a sincere with the intention of giving the Duke something to do out of harm's way was to prove to be an opportunity for the British. Hitherto, they had not seen the French lines in defense to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses and now they had their chance. Well, but they have given David a job with which he should never have been given because they're going to have this opportunity to see the French lines. David's going to do the job at first, and he's actually going to do a pretty good job of it at first. But the reports that he writes, though true and actually offer some helpful information, are dismissed because David wrote them. And so I think that whatever he was sending back was just sort of like, 
not received very well. It was sort of like, oh, uh, here's the report from David, whatever, and thrown back down. And it actually contained information that would have been helpful. So David, even though his job was unimportant in the grand scheme of things, he was offering some information, but there's just this disconnect. All right, well, we are going to pivot a little bit to talk about a very unfortunate relationship that the Windsors have restruck, and that is one with Charles Badeau. So apparently he's out of the sanatorium, and they decided to begin to be friends again, and they're meeting regularly through the months of the phony war. And Badeau was commuting between his offices in The Hague in Paris. Ferdi wrote to Baba and said, Last night I fixed a dinner in the private room here at the Ritz for Charles B. to meet them. He has much to say. He knows too much about every country in Europe and also our colonies. It is terrifying and he is right a great deal. He hinted also that Charles would be going to Berlin um, and that he had constant communication with the Germans. So this was known about Badeau by David, by Fruity. You know, it wasn't like they could have ever met with Charles Badeau under any illusion that he was not playing both sides of the fence here. Right. So for them to have trusted him, for them to have bothered to be friends with him is shocking to me because I just think, well, if you want anyone to believe, David, that you love England and that you are for England and that, you know, you may be far away, but you're still in the service of his majesty. How in the world could you ever be friends with Charles Badeau? How can you have a position in the British military in any capacity and still maintain friendships with this man? If you think that you should have been given a greater position, maybe schluff off some of these real questionable friendships in order for you to seem like a credible individual. But, you know, he's, he's bitter that he's not being given better appointments, but then he's continuing to have friendships with people that are not going to elevate him in his military positions. You are friends with the enemy. So no, we're not gonna give you better jobs to do. We can barely trust you with the one you have. All right, well, there was already concerns about the Duke being a security leak. George VI had noted in his diary that the Duke was seeing the secret plans of the French and that Wallace also knew about them and she was not to be trusted. The second Lord Ironside in 1987 told the author Charles Hingham, he said, my father determined that the Duke was a serious security leak. He was giving the Duchess a great deal of information that was classified in the matter of the defenses of French and Belgium. She in turn was passing this information on to the extremely dangerous enemy connected people over dinner tables in Paris. As a result, the information made its way to the German hands. And the historian uh, Gerhard Weinberg argued that there seemed to have been a German agent in the Duke's immediate entourage with or without the Duke's knowledge. And during the first months of the war, important information passed from his blabbering through the agent to the Germans. Now, there was questions about who this could possibly be. Remember, Charles Badeau had several former servants now working for David. And if Charles Badeau is so questionably linked to the Germans, is it possible that some of his servants were the, were the leak? The butler with the golden voice had formerly worked for Charles Badeau, but then also there was a maid who was a German spy. She went by the name of Miss Fox. That was her German code name. And so there were just questions about what wh what these two individuals were bringing back, if they were bringing back. Miss Fox probably was bringing something back because she traveled back to occupied Paris um, and reported to Ottawa Betts, Badeau's long-term friend. And, you know, it's possible that there was something going on there, but it was never definitive. It was never, it, it, nobody knew if it was the servants or not. Now, on October 6th, the Duke set off on his first tours of the French defenses, right? So he's going to do his job. He's going to try to do it right. And he had with him um, Captain Jean de Sol, a last-minute substitute to act as his translator and help write up the report. Saul had known Wallace, why Saul attached to the Washington Embassy during the 1920s. But it was his background in intelligence, he later served in M16, that accounted for his appointment. His role was to keep an eye on the Duke. Now, along for the ride around to these little outposts, these little French outposts to see how things were working, uh, Fruity Metcalf was, was there as well. And of course, we always get the colorful talk from Fruity, and he, he, thank God for him and his letters to his wife. He wrote, His Royal Highness was all through absolutely delightful company. No one could have been a more interesting or amusing companion. 
But the only few minutes I hated, and when he was all wrong, was when I had to get the hotel bills and get them paid. And then it was frightful. Why is money always the issue? We're going to see that come up a couple of times. Why was David such a horrific penny pincher? You know, we surmised a couple episodes back, was it because he had so much, so many child support payments he was sending out all over the globe? Hardly. I mean, I don't really know how much he was actually sending people, though we do, do know of a couple of individuals who received some monetary benefit. But that couldn't have accounted for why so many times when it comes to the money, he just can't manage it. Now, when it comes to buying something for himself or some of these stupid trinkets or a couple of canary diamonds or some dumb figurine, you know, they'll just shovel it out like it's just so much candy. But when it comes to, I don't know, paying for your hotel bill, paying, making sure that the waiter gets tipped, when it comes to things like that, I mean, he just throws an absolute fit. At the end of October, the Duke toured the French 4th and 5th armies, and he covered about 900 miles in three days. So he was doing his level best to get the job done that he'd been asked to do. Fruity remained confused, though, that once back with Wallace, the affection and camaraderie that they'd experienced on these trips was replaced by iciness. He wrote to his wife, it always will be the same, I believe, as long as she's alive, and she makes him the same way. So David, it seems, would always take on her personality when they were together. David was one way when he was with his friends, but when he was with Wallace, he too was cold as a cucumber. The Duke produced four reports on the French defenses, pointing out their areas of weakness, the poor morale and discipline, and questioning the reliance of certain litigations of soldiers. But they were largely ignored in London, with devastating consequences in May 1940. Honestly, it's a shame that his work wasn't honored, and I think it goes back to what I've already said. I think that whatever he did, whatever he wrote up, was just sort of sneered at. Like, all right, here we go. Here's his report. You know, just slap it down, put a bunch of other things on top of it, and tell yourself you'll get to it. I don't think anything he did would have ever been honored, honestly. Now, with this kind of disdain coming from his superiors, the Duke found it difficult to come to terms with his changed rank and status. And he was infuriated with the, quote, accidental discovery of an order issued by the king behind his back, which in effect imposed a ban on his entering areas occupied by British troops in France. But the reason is, is because every time he would go and meet with any of the British troops, he wanted to be lauded and praised and treated as royalty, but he's not supposed to be functioning in that capacity anymore, specifically not in his role um, as, you know, whatever it was he that he was doing, riding out to see these little French outposts. Um, Henry Pownall, the chief of staff to Lord Gord, wrote, the Duke of Windsor is on us again. He behaved charmingly here, but badly up front, where he took the salute of all the guards, which turned out. He's here as a soldier, not as royalty. If Master W thinks he can stage a comeback, he's mighty wrong. So that's sort of why the king said he's not allowed to go anymore in front of the British troops. And it could have been even this fear that he was going to, I don't know, pull an Absalom, where he tries to undermine the king to all of his common men and get them all on his side so that he can stage an uprising and overthrow the king. Who knows? But the Duke wrote to Mockton that he wanted to return to London because, as he said, the recent exposure of a network of intrigue against me makes my position here both impossible and intolerable until I have been able to clear the matter up with my brother. So he felt like there was just a whole network of people against him who were always going to stomp on his throat and he, you know, never would he be able to succeed as long as these people were at the helm. Churchill replied the same day and said he saw no objection to him coming over in a duty plane in the ordinary way if the king agrees, but the king did not agree and he refused to discuss the situation unless Lord Gort and Major General Hal Vice could be there, which they could not. Well, Windsor continued to be paranoid. He would leave these blue slips of paper in all of his letters that he would send back because he thought people were reading his mail and coming up with a scheme against him. And he'd leave these blue slips of paper in his letters um, typed with red ink and they would read, to, to whomsoever steams this letter open, I hope you are as edified at the contents of this letter as I am ha over having to write them. What a baby. All right, well, the reality is the Duke was sort of in a difficult position. If he did too well at his job, people would say he was trying to upstage his brother. If he kind of blew the job off and didn't try, then people would say you don't care about your country. So he was kind of in a hard hard way. One thing he did enjoy about the job was that he got to dress up for it, and you know how much he dearly loved to dress. 
Immaculately dressed in riding breeches and polished riding boots, he insisted on using his own cars and drivers, often with lots of luggage. I just can't get behind this vanity. You are traveling around to these little outposts, it's the, these, these, you know, random places where the French happen to be, and you've got to show up with luggage? Luggage for what? You know, I mean, it's just, you're going to be out for three days. You know, I think you can manage to wear the same shirt for three days. You know, considering that this is a military war situation, just pare it down, man. The fact is that when he would show up, it was just a distraction for the military. And they were, again, as we've mentioned many's the time, increasingly concerned about his loose talk. So him showing up was just like, oh gosh, we got to deal with this guy. As time went by, it became obvious that Dave was getting more and more discouraged by the whole thing. And he just didn't feel that his contribution was all that important for the war effort. And he was being sent off on these long tours to obscure French army zones, often in wet and freezing conditions. At the start, he had reported to his office at 11 a.m. daily, looking at the situation map, chatting with Howard Weiss for half an hour, and then he'd knock off for the afternoon. But presently, he was dropping in only three times a week, and then twice, and then scarcely ever, except for an occasional luncheon with Gamelin. On December 9th, the Duke wrote to Mockton, Well, the edge naturally has been taken off my keenness in the job. I am really only carrying on because it's the one that suits the Duchess and myself the best. Y'all, you're in a war, okay? Quit thinking about yourself. You know, well, I'm just doing it because it's what works out for us. So until something better comes up. Meanwhile, Wallace had her own selfishness going on. Now, she tried at the beginning to look like she was supporting the war effort. I mean, what are you going to do? Really lay back in the lap of luxury while everybody else is working? I mean, every other socialite was trying to contribute in some meaningful way. So she started out hot too. She'd operated a soup kitchen in a nightclub in Montmartre. And after British charities were not interested in her services, she became honorary president of the French Relief Organization, founded by Elsie Lady Mandel, distributing socks, gloves, scarves, toiletries, and cigarettes to French troops supposedly, and she's been given credit for, having created a new type of trench mitten with a zipper attachment permitting a soldier to use his trigger finger in an emergency. She had also joined the French Red Cross, taking plasma, bandages, and cigarettes to the front. But both the Windsors quickly lost heart, feeling that their efforts were not recognized. You know, quite frankly, you two, who cares if your efforts are recognized? This is a freaking war. Are you going to contribute or are you not going to contribute? Do you need a gold engraved letter every day saying, thank you so much for trying to save lives? Just do it already. Are you a member of the human race? Well, so I guess to combat the fact that they were feeling discouraged that no one was noticing all their efforts, they just decided to just go on constant holiday, you know. I mean, they tried, and it just wasn't what they thought it was going to be. It wasn't the fantasy that they had envisioned, so, you know, whatever. They continued to dine out extensively, often with Bedeau, not surprisingly, and their thoughts were only for themselves. And what especially annoyed the French was when he started pulling strings in both the French and British armies at her instigation to have their chef demobilized so that he could return to their kitchen. How are we going to go on if we can't have that iced tomato juice on lettuce leaves? You know, what about our plain steaks and chicken? Who's going to mix our tea with that barrel of London water we have at the constant ready? Surely we can't expect it to do that on our own. As time went by and the Duke became more and more annoyed, he decided that he needed to fly to London to sort of hammer out a new deal. I mean, how was he expected to survive the war with this unacceptable station in life? So he flew secretly to London, ostensibly to see Churchill and Edmund Ironside in the hope of lifting the ban on him visiting the British troops. But he really honestly had another purpose. He wanted to persuade the government to negotiate with the Nazis to bring the war to a swift end. Let's just hammer out a peace deal with those people. I mean, they're not that bad. So he apparently, uh, while he was there, met with some very questionable people, people who were friends with the enemy. One of the people he dined with on this secret trip to London was Major General J.C.F. Fuller who was a retired army officer, but also, and disturbingly, had been a principal guest at Hitler's 50th birthday parade in April 1939. He also saw, he also saw Lord Beaverbrook, who realized the Duke's idea of himself as the leader of an international peace movement and rival leader to his brother had never left his mind. 
But that didn't disturb Lord Beaverbrook because he was kind of really a-okay with all of David's plans for making peace with Germany. In fact, he thought that was an excellent idea to the extreme. Both men agreed that the war should end by a peace offering to Germany, and this was witnessed by Mockton. And this little conversation that they had where they were deciding what should be done with Britain and how they should come to a peace deal was the talk of the town. Now, Mockton was present at the conversation between Lord Beaverbrook and the Duke. And he told a friend who told another friend that it was a frightful interview between the two. Both found themselves in agreement that the war ought to be ended at once by an offer of peace to Germany. The Beaver suggested that the Duke should get out of uniform, come home, and after enlisted powerful city support, stump the country, in which case he predicted that the Duke would have a tremendous success. Of course, Mockton contended himself with reminding the Duke that if he did this, he would be liable to the UK income tax. This made the little man blanch, and he declared with great determination that the whole thing was off. Further evidence for the Duke's discussions with Beaverbrook came from Harold Nicholson's diary. He said the same. It seems that when the Duke of Windsor paid his visit here after the war, he dined with Walter Mockton, and Beaverbrook was there. He spoke about the inevitable collapse of France and said that he would return to England and conduct a movement for peace with Germany. Beaverbrook was delighted. Go ahead, sir, he beamed. I shall back you. When Beaverbrook went, Walter explained to the Duke that he had been speaking high treason and that if he really came to live in this country, he would have to pay income tax. The latter thought filled him with such appalling gloom that he gave up the idea of saving England by negotiating with Germany. And this gossip was again reiterated by Neville Chamberlain, who became aware of the discussion, and he wrote to his sister with tales of the same. I've heard, an, I've heard on unimpeachable authority that while the Duke of Windsor was here this week, Beaverbrook tried to induce him to head a peace campaign in this country, promising him the full support of his papers. Nobody was really surprised that this was David's position. It was just more confirmation that he was a snake. He was a snake they'd always known him to be. And that, it, you know, he just wanted to come back, be a hero. Oh, oh is that going to cost me something? Okay, well, then never mind. Forget it. England, you can just burn straight to hell. To further complicate things, there was intercepted information between the German ambassador to The Hague and their state secretary. Um, and these two Germans were communicating back and forth, essentially saying that David was unhappy. They knew him to be unhappy in the position that he had, that they thought that they could use his discontent in their favor, and that, but for a little careful planning on their parts, he could become a pawn in their whole scheme. Very, very ugly talk. And these communications between the two gentlemen went back and forth and back and forth, all of them circling around the Duke, all of them saying, how can we pump him from information? What might, how might he be a good source of information? Who can we place around him to get him talking? They knew they could count on him and they knew he had no real loyalties to anybody. In one communication, uh, it was reported, the Duke of Windsor, about whom I wrote you in my letter of the 27th last month, has said that the Allied War Council devoted an exhaustive discussion at its last meeting to the situation that would arise if Germany invaded Belgium. On the military side, it was held that the best plan would be to make the main resistance effort in the line behind the Belgian-French border, even at the risk that Belgium should be occupied by us. Can you even believe that David was just running his mouth like this, telling the enemy the position, telling the enemy the plans, of the French and the British. Can you even believe that? Why would he ever do that? What was his, like, high, high treason that you would sit to dinner and just, you know, blab. Like it was just no thing because you are so desperate for other people to like you and to approve of you and to put their stamp of approval on you that you will just sell out your whole country, your family, your friends, everybody, because you're so desperate for people to be like, that guy knows something. All right, but what's really interesting, actually, is the information that the Germans had from David's own mouth was not true. Now, David thought it was. It's possible that the Duke was in communication with Churchill and that Churchill, knowing full well that David was going to run right over to the Germans and say whatever, was feeding David misinformation to keep the Germans guessing and confused and functioning on faulty ground. 
I would hope that's what Churchill would do, because up until now, I've been a little bit frustrated with how chummy he is with David. Now, I understand that Churchill really, really, really loved the monarchy, and he wanted to do whatever he could to continue to uphold respect for the royal family, which is why he was willing to do a lot of favors for David. When David would show up, he'd have a military band, even though no member of the family could be bothered to come out and meet David. Churchill wanted David treated with respect and dignity, but he wasn't an idiot. And I think that it's completely possible that he was feeding David wrong information. And I don't think this is a time for us to decide that David had some kind of moral conscience and was feeding the Germans so incorrect information um, of, of his own volition. You know, I don't think David was so clever that he's like, oh, they trust me, I'll confuse them. He, he doesn't think that way. So it can only be surmised that David had been given faulty information on purpose. What's exceptionally concerning, though, is the fact that these two Germans who were writing back and forth to each other about the Duke said that the information he was giving was said that the information he was giving was going directly to the Fuhrer and that Hitler was loving this little bit of inside information and he wanted them to collect more. And so regardless of the fact that what David was saying actually did, turned out to not be accurate, Everybody in the situation thought it was. David thought it was accurate information. The German ambassadors thought it was accurate information and certainly Hitler did. And so it doesn't matter that it was false information. It matters that everybody's motivation was impure. David did not care. And the fact that what he's saying is going straight to the top is so upsetting because couldn't David have surmised that it would? But we know how he is. He's been looking for that in with Hitler low these many years. You know, he keeps trying to make a connection, a relationship with that guy. And Hitler's only ever used him. I don't think David would have been upset that Hitler was relying on him for information. I think that would have thrilled his sad, sorry little heart. Now, as it turned out, it came to light uh, by Major Langford, an M16 officer in The Hague that the very clever spy in the German embassy named Walbach had informed him that the Duke's friend and advisor, Charles Bedeau, was visiting the German ambassador on an almost fortnightly basis. Bedeau was alleged to bring defense materials, strengths, weaknesses, and so on of the best quality. As it stood, Bedeau was already on M15's radar. And the French version of the FBI was already keeping tabs on what Bedeau did. But now that security leak that they knew had been a problem was definitely pinned on the back of Badeau. The source of the leak was now clear. All right, so it's not Miss Fox, the maid. It's not the butler with the golden voice. It's who we knew all along. It's Badeau, right? And so it's almost like, tell us something we don't know, you right? It's like, of course it was Badeau. We've known all along he was playing both sides of the fence. But I guess... You know, it's definitively now it's him because the very things that David where David knows, Badeau knows, you know, so I guess it's good to know exactly who that was. At dawn on the 10th of May, the Germans invaded France and the Low Countries targeting the Ardennes, which Windsor's reports had revealed were vulnerable, but nobody cared because nobody read what he had written. They do care now, but they didn't care at the time. The same day, the Duke made arrangements for Wallace to leave and to go sit it out in a specific hotel where she might be safe. Supposedly, the Duke spent the days after the invasion tearing up secret documents and burning them in the fireplace at the Duke's embassy office. But this was interesting that he should have any documents to be tearing and burning because his uncle Patrick, always known as Peter, had been sent out in September of 1939 nominally as clerk to the Duke, but essentially to make sure that the Duke never took a single piece of paper home where it might fall into the hands of the Duchess. They knew the Duchess was all chummy with Ribbentrop, so they didn't want any kind of thing at the house that she might just shuffle on over to her lover. Further evidence for suspicions about the Duke's loyalty comes from a letter on May the 20th, with Howard Weiss reporting to Hardinge that no military information is to be given to His Royal Highness over the telephone, other than confirmation of what is already common knowledge, and as little of that as possible. It is just clear throughout this entire chapter that Buckingham Palace was being kept closely advised of the Duke's activities and they just resented a hundred percent having to deal with him at all. The chaos reigned during those days in mid-May. The phony war is over. The real war has come. As you know, the Ninth Army could not take it. The general and all his staff are now either shot or prisoners of war, wrote Fruity to Baba on May 24th. He said, it has been a terrible shock and surprise. I fear there are bigger shocks to come. His Royal Highness came back two days ago. 
I am very uneasy about him. He might do anything. Anything except the right thing. I live from hour to hour fearing to hear the worst. He talks of having done enough. Of course, do not repeat any of this. I do not know what will happen. The day before, Hitler had halted three separate Panzer Corps, and this let the British Expeditionary Force escape. But the question was, why would he do that? Because the supply tail did need to catch up, and the tanks needed to be maintained, but the Germans could have lasted a few days more. So why did he halt all of that? And some people have suggested that Goring wanted the Luftwaffe to have credit for the victory, and he didn't want the Panthers to get the credit. But there's another possibility, that Hitler hoped to sue for peace, and that with Windsor as a Penane figure, to allow him to concentrate on his plan for living space in Eastern Europe. And you guys all remember from history class how Hitler wanted to take over Russia and he wanted to reseed the land of Russia with German farmers and war veterans and he wanted to deport all of the Germans to Siberia to sort of just figure it out over there. Um, and I guess he thought that David could be a real help in this plan. I don't know. We, we, may, we may never know why he decided to halt the Panzer Corps and why he thought he had a possibility of suing for peace and why he thought David was going to be a, a, a pin in all of this. Who knows? What, I, I mean, I can't even begin to surmise. I, I don't, I, I have no idea. But what I think is more interesting for all of us and the sort of information we want is that on the, on the evening of May 27th, at the height of all the chaos that is beginning to explode all across the land, Fruity, who had been working without payment, said his usual good night, sir. See you tomorrow morning. The following morning, he put through his usual call at 8.30 a.m. to the Duke to be told. His Royal Highness left at 6.30 this morning. Fruity had worked for months without pay. All right, he had been a loyal friend to David for years when everyone else had turned his back. He went to the wedding. He stuck by his side. He stayed with him when David was an impossible person. He stood in the gap between him and other people's disappointment of him. He constantly tried to be a good friend. And then, just like that, up in the middle of the night, David takes himself, all his belongings, all his people, all his luggage, all his bags, all his things, all his cars, everything, and abandons Fruity. And there, he's just left to try to find his way out of a war zone. He had sacrificed his own needs for those of the Windsors. And he had been abandoned to find his own way home by someone he had called his best friend. He wrote to his wife, regarding my late master, he has run like two rabbits. He never made one single mention of what was to happen to me or his paid comptroller, Phillips. He's taken all cars and left not even a bicycle. He has taken all articles of value and all his clothes. After 20 years, I am through. Utterly, I despise him. I fought and I backed him up knowing what a swine he was for 20 years, and now it's finished. The man is not worth doing anything for. He deserted his job in 1936. Well, he's deserted his country now, at a time when every office boy and cripple is trying to do what he can. It is the end. As it turns out, uh, his comptroller, Gray Phillips, uh, eventually got to the south of France hitching lifts on military lorries, and somehow Ferdy Metcalf reached London on... Uh, June 5th, 1940, assuming he also had to try to hitch rides and scramble around and manage himself in very secretive ways, trying to get out of there alive. Can you even believe this? The report that Howard Weiss filed on the work of various officers under my command does not even mention the Duke. His only comment was, I wish never to be asked about that man again. That's the end of the chapter. Wasn't that a good one? Can you even believe it? The appalling selfishness is on display on every single page, not only with how he treated his friends, but how he treated important information that should have been kept close to the chest. You know, selfishness, selfishness, selfishness. His entire life is marked by selfishness, you know? And even that paltry attempt that he and Wallace made at the beginning to look like they were like, good little warriors, you know, he's doing his little job and she's rolling bandages. And then after a while being like, people aren't noticing us the way we expected them to. Are you for real right now? Do you understand the entire world is at war and you're worried that people aren't noticing you enough? Unbelievable.
All right, that's the end of that chapter. I will see you next week with our next installment. The next chapter is called Escape. So that ought to be interesting. Bye. I'll see you later.